Al, are you there? Hi. Hi, Piero. I am here. I don't see you. I hear you. Let's start yeah. reading. Uh, oh, yes. Now, now. <laughs> In and out. I, see, I see you. Who's next to you? Uh, this is my buddy, Brian Day. Hello. Uh, Brian. And Brian and I collaborate on sound projects, and he's going to do a closing event here at the gallery on January 28th when the exhibit oh. comes down. Okay. And Brian, Brian owns a record label and has been performing uh, globally for many years. How do I get some light on me? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, we go. Much better. Bon yeah, Bruno. great. And um, great. yeah, Brian me, just came yeah. back from Brazil and India uh, doing a big world tour. Excellent. Let me briefly introduce you to the audience for uh, those who don't know you. Uh, Carl is a pioneer San Francisco machine art underground, uh, founder of Seaman, who was an interact legendary interactive machine art performance collective, has collaborated with Survival Research Lab, has contributed to Burning Man before it became a tourist attraction for Silicon Valley engineers with exhibits like uh, The Gates of Hell, and I could go on for a long time. Thank you, Carl, for pioneering uh, this uh, this uh, very creative kind of art. Um, I think I should just let you go. He has uh, Carl is an exhibition in San Francisco, and I thought it was uh, interesting to have a tour guided by him. Uh, so I'll let you. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm sure you are creative enough. You will do something interesting. Go well, for it. Um yeah, thanks, Piero. Thanks for letting me be here. Hello, everyone out there in the world. I'm at Telematic Gallery. We have an exhibit running right now for the next couple months. And Telematic is on 10th Street in San Francisco. And they specifically show just art and technology work and a lot of video stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, they've also hosted some performance work. And luckily, we have on site the director of Telematic Gallery, Clark. And so let's see if we can get Clark in the shot. I'm in the dark here, can you see? Um, here, uh, dark, dark. There he is. Hi, Clark. So say something about the gallery, Clark. Well, uh, as Cal said, actually we're a media arts gallery. We uh, feature time-based arts, broadly speaking, uh, but with a focus on screen culture and uh, art and contemporary technologies. And um, we're delighted to be showing Cal's work and uh, the show is up uh, through January. So um, if you have the chance to come by, I hope you will. Yeah, so uh, I know it's quite dark, but we have the, the, the gallery is painted black for the exhibit, which actually makes it look really good. And then it's somewhat dimly lit and didn't want to play with that lighting too much. But so what I've got is a good, I don't know, 10, 12 pieces that are about um, how we measure and understand the cosmos. And what I'm doing is riffing on a lot of historic scientific experiments going back to um, work the Arabs were doing 1,000, 1,500 years ago up to um, 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 Clark. Wait, <laughs> Clark's turning everything on. Um, 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 bum, 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 up to ironic, funny, funny enough, ent a quantum entanglement, which is a project I've been working on for about a year or two, and they just won the Nobel Prize for it. So I'm riffing on these experiments, trying to use contemporary technology, often for some very ancient uh, experiments, as well as um, Heck, I don't even know how they do quantum entanglement. Is that just math? But I'm entangling um, some quantum particles that we'll see in a minute. So I'm gonna just walk us around the gallery and we'll check things out. So I'm gonna see if we can roll. Oh, oh well, actually behind me, uh, some drawings, more drawings of uh, my work and ideas before they are manifested into these different pieces of hardware and technology. Okay, is this gonna get brighter? Yeah. Oops. 
what do we have there? We have um, a very dark me. Um, that's a riff on Fizeau's experiment that he did in Paris in 1840, as well as Jocelyn Burnell's uh, experiment that she used to measure quasars that we are now still trying to find some light. Ah, this doesn't work at all. But uh, um, how uh, Jocelyn Burnell um, sort of left the uh, immediate uh, planet and started to measure the cosmos. And, and of course, she's the famous uh, physicist, astronomer, whose ideas ripped off by some jackass who won the Nobel Prize for her work. And so often a lot of, some of these uh, experiments I'm thinking about and riffing on are artists who were, whose ideas were stolen or they were threatened with death. Primarily those are uh, people of color and women, it turns out. Right here we have the California State Rock. Maybe people might know what that rock is. There's two conductive sensors. This is uh, something I call moving mountains. Got a um, portable briefcase with the, a video of the moon in it. Very dark again. <laughs> I've got Brian to be my help, help, helpful light man. <laughs> so yeah, video, video of the moon in a briefcase. You can fold up the briefcase, briefcase and and be have a, a Duchampian um, valise um, with the moon. What's going on here? We've got a meteorite. Meteorite. We've got a proximity sensor and a giant electromagnet. And this is, um, several of these pieces are versions of clocks. And again, uh, measurement devices that humans use to understand our place in the cosmos. And so I wanted to relaunch this meteorite into space. But what I also wanted to do was hear time and, and how um, so many uh, pendulums or clocks, you hear the tick, tick, tick. What I was interested in was hearing the hardware and hearing the sensor every time it's triggered. And so I'm taking a tiny signal from the sensor and sending it to a subwoofer, an amplifier, and then a subwoofer that's down here on the floor in the dark. So um, yeah, meteorites have a bunch of iron in them. And so they're attracted and repelled by the, by the electromagnet when, they, when the meteorite gets close to the proximity sensor. I always love it when people see it and they're like, so perpetual motion? Uh, yeah, sure, but no. Moving along, I live on Mariposa Street in the Mission, and one night, it's a full moon in June, and I gotta go out and videotape the moon. So I've got a video of the moon with a light sensor on the moon, and it's reading the light and dark. That light sensor triggers a servo motor And then the servo motor is rubbing up against this symbol. So I, what I wanted to do was build an art piece where I could hear the moon. And I especially like that the symbol, it's like a, it's a Balinese symbol, happens to look like a UFO. How cool is that?
<laughs> so there we have um, um, Hearing the Moon. Got a couple photographs that I took uh, while I was building the work. And it came out so beautifully, incredibly sci-fi. And that's uh, several laser beams being bounced off of mirrors in Mylar. And this is the interior of a piece we'll see in a second about, um, again, Jocelyn Burnell's work and entangled particles. But first, we're going back in time to um, a residency I did in Florence, Italy at the Galileo Museum. And Galileo did all these great experiments with rolling balls. This is hooked up to a proximity sensor and turns on when someone walks near it. So what I was interested in is, can I hear gravity? This is uh, a series, again, I was mentioning clocks and light, let there be light. Um, uh, and this is a version of what I think of as a clock and try to reinterpret time and how I feel like time is made to get workers to show up and then to document how much they worked. And so this is sort of my anti-capitalist work around is how can I build different kinds of clocks that change time. So for instance, I don't know, if this goes off a hundred times, can I get paid for a day's work? And why are we tied to um, 60 minutes to an hour? I um, bronze casted the moon. And this is from the same video uh, we saw a second ago where we were sonification where we were hearing the moon and and here we're hearing gravity and now we get to look at the mass of the moon in bronze and i took uh, i took a photo of the moon when i was videotaping it my buddy 3d printed it for me and then we had that 3d print cast in bronze come on everyone wants a bronze moon i know i did Moving along, we have crystal with a green laser pointing at it. I just shoot. And this is another, yet yeah, another version of a clock. So my clock goes counterclockwise. And uh, kind of stoner, kind of beautiful. And what I was thinking about, um, a lot of these pieces are dealing with light. And that light is this one constant, how we're measuring the cosmos, except when light travels in matter. And then light isn't a constant, it travels at a different speed according to the matter. And I was intrigued in using an organic material, stones, rocks, sort of geologic time to change uh, the speed of light, which is then hooked up to my clock. All right, we're moving along to quantum entanglement, people. It's going to be really interesting to try and show you. Mm. 
And so what I've got is this box um, wrapped in um, safety, a safety blanket with a window cut in it where the entanglement happens. Oh, I got to turn on the fog machine. Just a second. You're nothing without a fog machine. On top are two light sensors, light sensors here in this box, and the light sensors will trigger um, other uh, light waves from uh, the audience's phone and the, the flashlight on your phone can turn on and off this piece. And this is quantum entanglement. So this is what just won the Nobel Prize, but this is my interpretation of it. Oh, it has a speed control too. So the audience can speed it up fast as well. So what's going on here? Um, multiple lasers, a mirror that's spinning, which is a riff on uh, Fizeau's experiment that he did on Montmartre in Paris in 1840, and also how Jocelyn Burnell, uh, so Fizeau's measuring light with, uh, with a lantern and mirrors, and we're doing it we're measuring the speed of light and measuring distance with lasers and mirrors and light sensors that are amplified and then sent that signal from the sensors is then sent to is then amplified so we can essentially try and hear the speed of light the particles entangle because there are multiple light sources and a little fog machine misting in there which then is particulate that um, can, can capture light in space and hold it. Can you believe that? Well, you better because there's more. So uh, um, I've been at a bunch of exhibits really all over the world. And some of the most forgotten spaces are bathrooms. <laughs> and I came into this clean, white, shiny bathroom, and I thought, this needs some art. So here we are in the bathroom <laughs> of Telemeta Gallery. There's Brian. <laughs> and uh, tucked in the corner is, um, is a labor laser etching that I did at a wonderful artist residency in Berkeley. That, um, that Verge was also uh, working at when I was there. And so I started laser etching different historic scientific um, concepts and ideas on the hunks of marble, thinking, oh, well, hopefully they'll find this in 10,000 years. And they'll know that we at least knew what Kepler knew, that uh, the orbits of different planets. Over here, some more. Um, geologic deep time art. And this is a big old crystal on an aluminum box. And what do we got here? Proximity sensor. So it's making really wonderful marks on the aluminum and 
I don't know if you can quite capture the amazingness of the sound that it's producing, but it's kind of vibrating the whole sink. Um, you can play it like an instrument. I put a light underneath it so when it's when I hold my hand up in front of the proximity sensor, both the crystal starts spinning and and the light turns on. We're leaving the bathroom now. <laughs> Heading back into the main gallery. There's Clark hanging out by my drawings. Um, Clark, this is an art gallery. And the art is for sale, as most art galleries are. And we've had some sales. And, um, you know, uh, to be honest, uh, sales are few and far between with art and technology work. But um, every penny is a miracle on this journey. You want to do the overhead too, huh? Oh my gosh, the pièce de résistance. Thank you, Clark. Sure. So I have a, a, an experiment up on the ceiling, and it's a laser in one corner of the room that um, hits a mirror and then spins around, goes through a filter, and hits a a light sensor, which then again creates sonification. Turn that baby up. Oh yes, now we turn everything on. So um, here's the laser, sort of hard to see, hitting a lens, a two-way lens. It then comes, goes, cuts through the lens, hits the spinning mirror in front of another mirror, and then it bounces the light around the room. Over here, sort of in the dark in the corner, is a light sensor that's then run to a subwoofer down here in the dark on the floor. <laughs> um, a great reflection, sort of accidental um, reflection on the wall. And this lens, this two-way lens is interesting. It's really just a film. And if you blow on it, you can change the audio and give you this pattern on the wall. Um, often I'll show this to people and they're like, uh, my scientists, geek friends are like, oh yeah, Fizeau, sure. Uh, this is great. Uh, using a, uh, you're not using a lantern. Uh, you are using, I am using a mirror, but it's spinning. And then my light source, of course, again, is a laser. But instead of having to count the flickers of light like Fizeau did, we can count beats and speed the beats up and down. That is my art show, folks. You know, I, um, at a certain point, I just felt like so much art was so boring and uninteresting that I, um, I'd always think, what would I want to see? What would a young cow want to see? And, and what is the role of technology in our lives? And can I use technology to speak poetically to the human existence, or even how we frame our existence and our reality. And uh, this thread of work 
was really started over 10 years ago when I um, read a great book called The Demon Haunted World that was written in the early 90s about the anti-science movement. And here we are 30 years later and 10 years after I started sort of riffing on uh, these experiments, um, the anti-science movement is bigger than ever. So uh, that is you know, an inspiration for this work. You know, and then uh, I care about science because I just care about the planet and equality in human well-being. And um, that, those are the driving forces to make this work. Thank you, Carl. Questions?